this one out because we did this in class and if you remember we designed a we designed something based on the deflection criteria being less than or equal to the span over 600 and based on that our expectation was that the bending stress was going to be a lot less than 60 percent of the yield stress and it didn't work out that way as I ran through this without a calculator we're going to just deal with the interior one. We may have done the exterior in class, but, and let's figure out that, in fact, uh, this is actually we are doing the interior one, which has some, a load, and we're going to talk about what this load is in a little bit. So 12, we start with this, that we know that if we design to an equation uh, where the deflection criteria is less than span over 600 and we use the equation for a uniformly loaded simply supported beam with the maximum deflection equal to 5 WL to the 4th over 384 we can end up solving times E times I we can solve for I and then we know that I over C equals S and we can go from there so let's think about how this works out our assumption is that if we design for a small deflection, our stress will be covered. So what did we have? Well, we talked about interior and exterior bays, and we were dealing basically with a, uh, a set of girders here. This, of course, are your interior girders and exterior girders, and let's just look now at the interior girder. The span, as we laid it out, was 180 inches or 15 feet. The modulus of elasticity of steel is 30,000 KSI, KSI or 30 million PSI. The load is 12 kips, and let's look at why. Based on 40 pounds per square foot load, and we'll talk about that does not include the self-load of the floor and everything else, so you're going to see some kind of additions and, and going back. But we have 40 pounds per square foot, and if we think about how much goes to any particular girder, we see that even though it flows through beams, we have essentially what is 20 by 15. So that's 20 times 15 is 300 times 40 gets you 12 kips. If we do that in 12 kips per figured out per inch, we get to this value of 0 0.0666 kips per lineal inch. The exterior, of course, is very similar with the only difference being these two. Remember we talked about these having an asterisk and that it's a little bit worse than that because these are not spread out over the whole beam. You've actually got some beams which lay on top of the girders or are tied into the girders in some way. So you've actually got a point load here. But we're going to make this assumption that that's how the load looks because we want to be a little conservative. We then went through in class this idea of solving for the required moment of inertia being equal to that solution figured out and isolated for I. We took I across here, we put the 600 up there and we canceled one of the L's and we have 600 times 5 times WL cubed over 384E and we should have come up with somewhere in the order of 101 inches to the fourth. Now I can show you how that looks in a calculator. This is where I, in fact, you're punching in class. Try it again here. Here's what it was, 600 times five equals times point oh six 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 equals times 180 equals times 180 equals times 180 equals divided by 384 equals divided by 30,000 equals and we end up with that 101.24 for a required modulus of elasticity. I'm sorry for a required section modulus, I'm sorry, for a required I smota, right? That's what's required. We remember that we, we were doing it for a 10 foot deep, 10 inch deep beam because we took the span, which is about 16 divided by two is about eight, add two, we ended with 10 inches deep. The section modulus required would then be I divided by C or 101 divided by five, which is 20.25, and we would find a beam that matches that. Now, how do we figure out the bending stress? We need to know the act maximum interior moment. So we know from that 
concept and that long two to three class discussion of a sag and a cable, a parabolic cable that we know the maximum moment for you for a simply supported Going back here, simply supported, uniformly loaded beam is in DAC little w l squared over 8. So now we're going to take take out the calculator again and take little w, 0.066666 times 180 times 180 over 8. You get 270 kip inches, and we know that the formula for the bending stress is the moment divided by the section modulus. And so we ended up something in the order of 13.5 ksi. And that makes a lot more sense, I think, than what we had in class. We know this is less than or equal to 60% of 36 KSI, which is the same as less than or equal to 21.6 KSI. And so we are way within the stress criteria when we do something like this. Where again, probably one of the most easiest things you're going to do is come up with this basics based on the idea of loads and then come back later on and adjust this number up based on the weights of the member itself as well as the other things that it is supporting. So we'll talk about how these loads of 40 pounds per square foot and I talked about it if you, you know you got an x-ray machine or an MRI or whatever something heavy here sometimes one of these bays that will look the same as all the others is going to have a different loading constraint. All right so this idea will finally end it up with this with different colors you want to very quickly decide that you've got some, see if I can do the color thing here. You want to identify very quickly. Okay, we want to identify quickly the corner columns, your exterior columns, triangles here. And then your interior columns, I guess, will make a diamond, okay? You have to realize that, except when you have things like shear walls and all that going on there, what you have is the corner columns take one corner of a bay, the exterior columns take one half a bay, right? in terms of the load pattern and your interior columns go back here take basically a full bay so breaking things up this way and then identifying your patterns of numbers is an important important concept right I want to point out once again and a reason why I put this out is in fact there's just a couple formulas, and I'm going to now finish this out one more time, whether you're in class or not. File, new, let's look at these, right? Remember, a simply supported, uniformly, ooh, nice, simply supported, sorry, uniformly loaded beam, subject to a load of W with a span of L. The maximum moment is going to be equal to WL squared over 8. The deflection is going to be 5WL to the 4th over 384EI, with E being the modulus of elasticity and I being the SMODA. That is for a simply, loaded, simply supported uniformly loaded beam. For a cantilever, once again under a low W, it's going to be the maximum moment you're going to see this later. M max is going to be the same as that, but four times more. So WL squared over 8, but in fact four times more. We'll prove that in a little bit. And in fact, the maximum deflection is going to be 5WL to the fourth over 384EI times what? A lot more, 48 fifths, about 10 times. Let's prove this one to you. This, of course, is equal to WL squared over 2. Let's see what that looks like. I'm going to walk and do it a little bit reverse here. I've got this sense here. And I've got my wall here. And I'm going to essentially cut. And what's behind me is not important. So I'm going to show a tension, a moment, and a shear. You remember that you take this WL. 
right? And that goes right there. This is in fact, the value of that double hatch is WL and how far away is it from you? L over two and so you have the moment being WL squared over two or four times worse. And of course that maximum moment occurs right there for this deflection. Remember that this is going to, if it's a cantilever, it's gonna look like this when it's done under a load as opposed to a simply supported beam, which has got a moment there, support there, it's gonna look something like this. This is, all the moment is negative. And all the moment is positive, positive moment, right? Now, you will soon and eventually realize, ooh, look at that, cool, ooh, nice. You will realize that in fact, there is really only one equation where this all comes from. I've mentioned it before, one over the radius of curvature equals the moment divided by the resistance to the moment, the rotational stiffness is, but of course this also has boundary conditions. And when you decide to not, let's see if I can put this in a new color, do not go to lunch. You're actually, you're doing what? You're providing boundary conditions to some of those members that might be out there so they can't twist and snap. So if that is news to you, right, right, you'll see that this is not necessarily all that bad to do the mathematics, right? And you'll see later what we have to, why we have to talk about all that other stuff is because of the fact of these boundary conditions. And so finally to keep this within 15 minutes, let's say you know and finally do calculate all the members that you need, then what is the steps without looking at the fancy dancy Revit? What do you do? You draft your levels and then you draft your grid and then you put in your columns, and then you put in your girders, and then you put in your beams, right? Deciding on basically this all has to do with what? Geometry. And then once you know all that, you come up with your loads and you figure out your member sizes. And all you do in Revit is you update. And basically, it will do a lot of what you need to do in terms of learning your cut lengths, your weights, and etc. So this is the geometry. Remember, you start with a coordinate system. Coordinate system. You lay out your levels first, and then you do your grid, and then you do your columns, and then you do your girders, and then you do your beams, and then you do perhaps your floor and roof. You can actually work this way down or other ways you work this way up sometimes. Once you know the geometry, you decide on the loads. The loads, believe it or not, come from what? They come from geography and codes, right? So the wind blows a certain way here. We worry about tornadoes. We don't worry too much about earthquakes. Other places they worry about earthquakes and tsunamis. So the geometry and the use of the building. And then basically also the local geography as well. We'll talk a little bit about that. Local geography gets you the concept of what? Environmental loads and then dead loads and live loads. We'll talk a little bit about that, dead loads live loads and load combinations, right? So the loads will tie into the geometry to get you the individual member loads and then you get the member sizes and you work up from there. So you'll see me using a fair bit of this 40 pounds per square foot for a basically a floor live load and pretty much sometimes we'll talk about wind load and everything else. So pounds per square foot, of course the pounds per square foot have to be transferred to pounds per lineal feet based on tributary area and you work from that. Thanks for listening. I hope those numbers work out for you.